Hello and welcome back to The World This Week with me, Jonathan Steele. You may be familiar with Israel's use of administrative detention and the Palestinian prisoners who've gone on hunger strike in protest at being held without charge. But unless you've been watching very closely, you probably missed the news that the Israeli Knesset passed a new raft of draconian security measures earlier this month. The Anti-Terror Act has been described as one of the most dangerous and important pieces of legislation in Israel in recent times, but has failed to make even a ripple in the mainstream world media. In what could be a severe blow for the legal rights of Palestinians, the law formalizes powers to detain terror suspects without access to a lawyer and drastically widens the definition of a terrorist organization. Alex MacDonald has the background on this underreported story. The word security is never far from the lips of the Israeli government. Earlier this month, a new anti-terrorism bill was pushed, somewhat discreetly, through the Israeli Knesset, which will give new powers to authorities to arrest and detain suspected terrorists, a move which has disturbed more liberal parts of Israeli society, who have labelled the bill draconian and claim it threatens Israel's much-vaunted status as the premier liberal democracy in the region. The new bill enshrines administrative detention in law for the first time in Israel's history. Administrative detention in which suspects can be held without trial for an extended period of time have been considered a temporary measure due to a state of emergency which has officially been in place in the country since the 1940s. Now, these measures are part of law, allowing suspects to be legally held without trial for 30 days. There has also been much criticism over new powers the law will give to target charities and NGOs who are seen as terrorist sympathisers. Many social welfare organisations have already come under attack for having supposed links to Hamas and other Palestinian militant groups. There are fears that this law could further marginalise Palestinian rights groups who are already facing pressure and demonisation. Pro-Palestinian groups have not been the only target. Attacks by radical Jewish settlers on Palestinians and Israeli security forces were also included in the bill under the definition of terrorism. The price tag attacks, so-called due to graffiti scrawled at the scenes of the crimes, have involved vandalism, stoning, physical assault and the desecration of Muslim graveyards and Christian holy sites and are partly aimed at giving a warning to the Israeli government who are seen as too sympathetic to the Palestinians. Netanyahu has been wary of defining these acts as terrorism, though, and in a country where terrorism is universally associated with Palestinians, some political commentators have found the label outrageous, although some have also welcomed the measures. It's, it's a very complicated mission, but I don't think that the fact that they uh, call it terror activities or not is the main issue. When there is a terror, when, when people launch what we understand as a terror activity, like burning mosques or throwing a uh, cocktail molotov in, uh, on a car. It's a terror activity, and we do have the, the, uh, the tools to, to deal with it. Israel has made much of its own supposed fragility. Ever since former Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion first made the claim that Israel's enemies wanted to push all the Jews into the sea, the sense of existential fear, whether justified or not, has lingered over the people of Israel. However, by introducing ever new measures of state control and urging the need for ever greater protection, its politicians have, arguably, done little to assuage these fears. Alex MacDonald, Islam Channel. So are these measures really necessary to protect the security of Israeli citizens? Or do they push Israel a step closer to being a permanent police state? With me to discuss these issues, I'm pleased to welcome the veteran human rights lawyer Sir Jeffrey Beinman QC, who's campaigned against the detention of Palestinian children in Israeli prisons. I would also like to welcome back defence specialist Paul Schult, senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and lecturer at King's College London. And finally, joining us via Skype from Jerusalem, we welcome the journalist and Palestinian rights activist, Mart Musle. Welcome to you all. Well, let me come to you first in Jerusalem, Mart Musle. I mean, how big a step change is this for Palestinians in practice in the way they're going to be treated, do you think? And why did the Israeli government feel it necessary to make the change anyway? Well, I think these new laws are passed 
just to legalize uh, practices that, ha that are happening here uh, on daily basis, uh, mainly the administrative detention and other uh, practices that are that Israel uh, based. I mean, they 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 use the emergency law that's left by the British mandates in the 40s. Uh, now, with legal now be before uh, before legalizing uh, or passing this new law. Uh, Israel was very cautious about, uh, uh, you know, uh, about uh, targeting activists. Uh, well, cautious relatively, of course, because they've been targeting activists on a daily basis. But it's it's causing them a lot of PR problems uh, in 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 the with with the international community. So what's happening now is that they are legalizing uh, uh, these uh, practices, and uh, they are drawing a parallel to the. Uh, anti-terrorism or counter-terrorism laws that are passed in the U.S. and U.K. and other places. Uh, but but really, what's, I mean, what, what, used to be, what uh, they used to do before the act is the same thing that's defined in the law. For example, Abir Qopt is an activist from Nazareth. Uh, two weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, or uh, three weeks ago, she was uh, uh, summoned for questioning uh, because for an article that she wrote that's against uh, drafting Palestinian Christians into the Israeli army. And her, her charges were uh, inciting terrorism. So they actually use these terms before the act, but now with the act, it's, uh, it's going to become a law, it's going to become legalized. And thus, it, the effect that's going to happen is that the practices are going to become on a wider scale. And will the, will the sort of punishments for these things, the sentences passed by the courts, be more tough and longer than, than they are at the moment under the emergency uh, arrangements? I mean, at the moment, I mean, in, in the administrative detention that they use, they can uh, uh, put you in prison indefinitely without uh, telling you what your charges are. So it's, it's going to be the same thing. These administrative detention that's seen by the international community as illegal and by the Israeli law as illegal is going to become legalized not just an emergency law but a, 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 an actual uh, law and uh, they've elaborated more on the emergency laws that in defining what terrorism is so now uh, being uh, you you can be tried as a terrorist not just for being part of what they consider a terrorist group but also for showing uh, sympathy with them uh, for uh, deliberately or for uh, not stopping a terrorist act. And, you know, not stopping a terrorist act is, you know, it's open for uh, explanation and uh, for showing sympathy, for, for, uh, for uh, giving an opinion that they would think is sympathizing with, with what Israel would define as a terrorist act or inciting terrorism. So the definition of terrorism have become wider and uh, they practically can uh, arrest you for any reason and try and, and, and you know, right. charge I, you I with... I think we'll uh, just turn, if you don't mind, sorry to interrupt you, turn to one of our guests here in London, but particularly uh, Jeffrey Beinman, since uh, you follow these things extremely closely. I mean, Marth was making the point that initially the, this was all under the emergency laws inherited yes. from the British yes. mandate, and that was the argument that Israel used yes, to certainly. try and say nothing's very different. This is, you started this, and we're just following. Yes. Now they're going to say we're putting it into law, but it's just like the laws in Western countries. Well, let's deal with the UK anti-terrorism yes. laws. Do you see this as just simply codification of the same things we have here, or is it much worse? In, in some respects, yes, uh, because... Uh, we too have a law which allows the detention of terrorist suspects for up to 28 days. I think it's 30 days now in, in Israel. Um, and similarly, in, in, in the United States, there are, there are, there are, there are such powers. The, uh, the important point, I think, is not that the words of the law necessarily are different from the... Uh, uh, those in, in the US and, and the UK, but the selective enforcement of law. And I would mm. uh, mention particularly the, uh, the law as it's applied in the West Bank, which is military law. And, and of course, military law, uh, Israeli military law is very different from the, from the, uh, the law that applies in Israel proper. Uh, that applies to young people who can be detained for six months or a year. And uh, 
the um, the, 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 the Israeli youngsters in Israel for the identical offences, let's say throwing stones, uh, are subject to much, much more lenient treatment. This will apply in the military courts and the civilian courts, it seems. This new law, uh, we, I understand that uh, it will apply in the military courts, but in the military courts, the powers are already so draconian uh, that I don't know what practical difference it will make. The one, the one area where Israeli law seems to go far beyond law in the UK and in the US is in allowing indefinite detention uh, without limit. I mean, that seems to me uh, virtually uh, in gross violation of, of all international instruments. It's, it's, it's quite unacceptable to have uh, a, a, an unlimited, uh, unlimited detention power. You would agree with that, I imagine, Paul I, Schulte? Yes, I think it's... it's uh, it is unusual, indeed unprecedented, in, uh, with legislation with any, any nation I can think of, although perhaps in practice um, behaviour uh, in other countries also tends towards the indefinite extension. But what strikes me about this also is it's the normalisation. Uh, this is now the Israeli state saying things have become threatening to the extent we need this law, which is now no longer inherited from, from the British. This is what the Israeli state wants and believes it, it's necessary. And that's quite a, quite a symbolic step. It, 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 it's got an importance of its own. It's, it, it's telling the Israeli public something about how their government sees the future, which will, be, will require this, these kinds of powers indefinitely. And I think it's very difficult for foreign co commentators, or maybe in Israel, unclassified commentators, because as I recall these things working out in the Northern Ireland office where I, where I worked, it, it was periodically necessary to review legislation and, and create new laws and, and often with more sweeping powers. Uh, but that was done on the basis that certain cases had become uh, just too complicated to deal with, or, or there were categories of behavior that, that weren't caught by the law but should have been. And it was in the discussion of what's different and what, ne what needs to be addressed by this law that wasn't previously addressed, that I, that I think the, the big questions are. Those are typically done with, uh, worked through within um, parliamentary committees, often with access to, cl to classified information. Um, and without knowing what's the quality of discussion there, it's very difficult to know that how justified the Israeli government's claim is that terrorism has become bigger, more complicated, more diffuse, carried out by different organizations, and therefore the law needs to be changed to the extent it's going to be. Marge, let's come back to you in, in uh, Jerusalem. Um, one of the things I gather about the law is that people can be tried on the basis of evidence given by witnesses who don't appear in court, who they've given the witness, their evidence earlier at some stage, and therefore they cannot be cross-examined in a court. I mean, is that very different from what it used to be under the emergency uh, uh, arrangements, uh, the administrative arrangements? No, not really. I mean, that's what I said. The counterterrorism law, the new counterterrorism law, is just legalizing what's been there and what's been seen by a lot of people as illegal. And uh, for example, I mean, in, in, for example, in administrative detention, they detain you, uh, I mean, using secret evidence. So you don't know what, what your charges are really are. Uh, and that's still seen as illegal. and. Uh, you know, you right, you have a right to know what your charges are, and uh, you have the right to defend yourself. But under these laws, under these new laws, it's just legalizing this the whole process that's seen illegal by a lot of people or by the international community. And thus now, I mean, secret evidence is now legalized under the counterterrorism law. They can use secret evidence, and you're not allowed to have uh, uh, or to see a lawyer for 30 days as you guest said. We, 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 so, mentioned uh, at the, we mentioned at the beginning that the international media have hardly covered this development at all. What about in Israel? Have the, I mean, the rather active Israeli human rights groups, have they been making a big um, issue of this and, and trying to raise public awareness and opposition to it? Well, I haven't seen, uh, I mean, uh, I haven't seen many groups raise, trying to raise uh, awareness about it. Uh, the only thing that this, this uh, uh, law has been uh, 
put for a vote. Uh, they rushed it for a vote. Uh, they have criticized Livni for putting it on a vote before even the ministers have a chance to read it. Uh, other than that, they are not making a big deal out of it. But let's not forget, this also comes uh, side to side with another law, which is the anti-boycott law that still, it, ha it didn't pass fully. It passed uh, several readings, but it's yet to, be uh, to become a law. And, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, the state of Israel also sees uh, boycott campaigns or calling for boycotting uh, Israel as a terrorist act. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's important to see, uh, to see this counterterrorism law in, in, the, in the wider perspective of uh, all the law that's, been, that's being let's, passed. Let's, let's keep, keep on that point about the anti-boycott thing. I mean, if somebody wrote a, a, an opinion piece in an Israeli newspaper that said, um, we think that people outside the country are boycotting Israel are correct because this government's policies are bad. Would that be a terrorist offense for an Israeli journalist to say that? It, it will, I mean, under the anti-boycott law, it will definitely be at, uh, an offense. I don't know, it didn't pass yet, so uh, I'm not sure if they're gonna define it as terrorist act. I assume it will, but it's definitely it's gonna be passed as an offense. And uh, not just that, even if you said anything, I mean, you can be sued for saying anything about Israel and uh, anyone can sue you saying that whatever you wrote have led people to boycott their companies. So thus they get uh, a compensation from you. Well, so, Jeffrey, uh, the, yeah, yeah, Jeffrey, you want to come in on yes, that boycott I, I, issue? I do, because I think one of the key uh, features uh, of, the, of this law, and, and you can apply it in the United States and Britain too, is the very wide definition of terrorism. Uh, in the United States, material support for terrorism uh, is a very serious offence. It's been used uh, in the case which, which is the, concerns the Holy Land Foundation, which was providing uh, welfare support to organisations in Palestine. Uh, its senior uh, officers were sentenced to jail sentences of uh, up to 65 years for material support this for terrorism in the United in States. The United States. States. Yes. Now, uh, in Israel, the assumption, I think, the, uh, by the public at large, I suspect, so the, the, the Israeli public, the, the non-Palestinian or Jewish uh, section of the population is that these laws are not for them. These laws are for Palestinians. They are selectively used, intended and applied. And uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, is unfortunately becoming the case in, uh, in, in this country and in the US as well, because the people who are being targeted uh, Muslims in Britain, Muslims also in the United States. If a law is passed which the public at large don't consider is going to affect them, they're not going to complain about it. That would probably explain the lack of public protest about this law. The public protest would no, not come from the Israeli population. Slightly shifting the issue. Surely the revelations that The Guardian had two weeks ago about this national security agency thing rather runs against that because they suddenly made ordinary people aware that this anti-terror thing doesn't just affect people who are likely to be possibly be involved in terrorism, i.e. Muslims particularly, but, you know, the whole population is having its stuff uh, uh, potentially being watched and listened ah. to and read yes. by... Uh, outside agencies. Yes. yes, I mean, if you make people aware that, that it can affect them, then of course they will object. Although, although it's never been suggested that the vast swathes of people that the prison operation may be surveilling are in much danger of being prosecuted. The, the concern has been about privacy rather than no, vulnerability this, this to, to, that somehow, to sort of court. I think it's the point that William Hague made. That sort of if you're not doing anything illegal, you don't need to be worried about it. So if you're not planning a terrorist operation, you don't need to be worried about all this. You're, you're no, that's not, that's not the point I'm making. I think the point I'm making is that if it is widely seen that those who are targeted by the law do not include you, you're less likely to yes. object to it. But you don't think this law... I think in, in, in Israel, Israel, the it, law which is... We're now talking about uh, the law which uh, penalises uh, supporting terrorism in whatever way 
is targeted essentially at, at uh, Palestinians. It's not well, targeted Well, Martha, coming back to you, I mean, um, in our introduction, we pointed out that this law could actually affect Israeli or Jewish settlers in the, who are operating in the West Bank and are using violence of one kind or another. Is, is that, um, do you think it's, it will actually be used in that way? Actually, the experience has shown that uh, even uh, those settlers that the state of Israel have defined as terrorists in the past have have got have uh, gotten a more lenient uh, 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 sentences and are out and are still out. And for example, this uh, the new, the new the new organization that's called the uh, paper. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, tag price, I think. Uh, anyway, so th there's there's an, an, a, a group uh, of settlers who go on a regular basis uh, to Palestinian villages and uh, they slash tires, they burn cars, they burn uh, fields, and they still have problem in calling in in seeing what they do as terrorism. But on the other side, if a Palestinian boy, it's a Palestinian man, has throw a stone they easily define it as an act of terrorism. But let's also not forget that with the new law, that definition of terrorism is, is now wider. It's not only supporting a terrorist organization. It's not only being part of terrorist organization or a member of terrorist organization. It also includes uh, inciting uh, terrorism, which is very vague. Uh, it also includes uh, failure to prevent a terrorist act. Uh, or threatening to perpetrate a terrorist act, training or giving instructions to perpetrate a terrorist act. And all these terms are, are also vague and can be explained in, uh, in many different ways. What about charities what about and things that, that the authorities think are front organizations for raising money for, for, for terrorism? Are they now going to be in a difficult position uh, you know, to prove yes, their be. lack of uh, interest in terrorism? Yeah, and under the new law, is they gonna be uh, put in trial as, uh, as, uh, as you know, as doing an illegal activity pertaining specifically to terrorism, uh, and uh, the the sentences for terrorism is gonna uh, is gonna be double any sentence for a similar crime that does not that is not defined as terrorism. So if uh, an Israeli does a similar crime as a Palestinian. He can get uh, 15 years, for example, in prison. But the Palestinian, if he is tried under the new counterterrorism law, and he will, he'll get 30 years in prison. So that's another issue, also doubling the terms uh, or the uh, the sentences. Well, it sounds pretty draconian, doesn't it, Jeffrey? Well, it, it, it does, and I think I think the I'd, I'd come back to the point I made before. I think that the uh, the problem here is that. The law, uh, the definition of terrorism is so wide that it can be used uh, in a way that is very difficult to respond to. It's very difficult to answer. It's very difficult to say if you have given money to an organization uh, to help uh, relieve poverty, if, as it happens, one of the poor people happens to be a, a terrorist and you don't know that, it's very hard then to defend yourself and say, well, I had no idea. Mm. Because the fact is, your money, even if only a fraction of it, may have gone to a terrorist. We'll, now, we'll if your to, law is so wide... We'll ha I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> we'll have to end, end on that note because our time has gone out. But uh, thank you very much, Mart Musle in Jerusalem. Thank you, Jeffrey Weinman. And apologies again for cutting you off. Thank you, Paul Schulte. And thank you all for watching.